Hello and welcome to the Hour of History podcast. This is your host, Stephen Bauman, and this week with me is Andrew Hutchinson. He is a historian, an educator, an athlete himself, and someone who looked at a problem and created a solution. He saw that there were no books on the history of cross country. So he said, what the heck, I'm going to write the history of cross country. And he went out there and wrote the complete history of cross country running from the 19th century to the present day. It's a fascinating conversation. I hope you stick around till the end to get our suggestions. You will enjoy it. There's always more content at hourofhistory.com and hourofhistory.com forward slash rex. Thanks a lot for listening to the Hour of History podcast. On Hour of History, it's our world, anytime, any place. Enjoy. You're listening to the Hour of History podcast. Our world, anytime, any place. With your host, Stephen Bauman, and producer, James Abel. The Hour of History is a member of Episodic Network, an association of fun, interesting, and informative podcasts. Episodicnetwork.com. Without further delay, your Hour of History starts right now. Hello, and uh, welcome to the Hour of History podcast. Thanks for joining me, Andrew. Yes, thanks, Stephen. Thanks for having me on your show. Um, so it, it's cool to meet a cross-country uh, historian. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about your background? Uh, how did you get into cross-country? So I grew up uh, in the Bay Area in California, and I was running 5Ks uh, at an early age, uh, usually for holidays, turkey trots, you know, 5Ks <laughs> for the 4th of July, that type of thing. Um, and around the time I entered high school, all my friends shot up in size and strength, and I was left on the sidelines, literally, looking at the cross-country team, thinking to myself, you know what, I could probably do pretty well at that sport. Um, I ran in high school. I ended up running well enough uh, to get into a Division III NCAA college in Chicago, where I ran four years competitively in cross country there. And I really was a late bloomer, um, didn't break five in the mile until I was a senior in high school. And in the Midwest, they treat cross country running pretty seriously. They've got a lot of tradition. And of course the weather there is a little bit colder and a little bit more uh, autumnal with the changing of the leaves. So it, it really affected me in a profound way. And I came back to become a teacher, a history teacher uh, to teach at my former high school. And from there grew the team of eight students that I kind of had grown up with. Um, you know, with the smaller cross-country team size to a team of about 60. And um, when I was performing their kind of virtual end-of-season yearbook um, d- development, putting that together, uh, I realized that I wanted to include something history-related on the sport. And when I poked around online, I didn't find very much. Uh, that coincided well with what I was doing at Stanford at the time, and it allowed me a lot of their resources there for um, night classes I was taking for a master's in liberal arts there. And from there, I kind of just put together kind of a a loose uh, chronological history of the sport and um, recognized early that I needed to delve deeper into the subject to really become more knowledgeable about it because there were so many things that I was learning that were either forgotten and unreported or gaps in the history or just flat out plain cool information that struck me as something that would be worth sharing. And in the span of about five years, uh, I really became obsessed uh, in, in a healthy way uh, on the subject and ended up taking time off work, ended up traveling to Europe, uh, into the Moravian region of the Czech Republic, which is the backyard of uh, Emil Zadopek, who grew up uh, in Europe there training and um, pursued a lot of leads and, and opportunities to chat with professionals, both current and former um, Olympians like Craig Virgin and Thelma Wright and Doris Brown Heritage and gosh, the list is almost endless, um, who helped me contribute to this story. And I worked on it chronologically. Uh, the beginning pages was, was where I started learning about the, the absolute genesis of the sport, the absolute origin of the sport. And it took me all the way up into the present day, which coincided nicely with the most recent World Cross Country Championships in Denmark in 2019. Um, and just coincidentally fell almost exactly on the 200th year history of anniversary of the founding of the first Aaron Hounds game of cross country, which is the, the origin of the sport. It's, it's kind of extraordinary too, because um, anytime there's centennials of any sort, uh, historians seem to go crazy, but like you kind of allude to a lot throughout the book, uh, you know, cross country's kind of flown under the radar a little bit, um, but not always. Um, 
before we get into all that, I'm curious, as you were growing up and going through you know, this process of being in the sport, cross country is a bit different because you don't have an access to history like you do if you might be playing baseball or hockey or something like that. Um, what, what sort of interest did you have in the history while you were in high school or while you were in college? And, and were you doing any writing at that point? So th that's a wonderful question. And one of the things that I was fascinated with growing up was, of course, this, the statistics uh, surrounding professional sports leagues. Um, I was a pretty avid uh, baseball fan, Major League Baseball fan, football. Um, all my extended family growing up were athletes as well. Um, I always felt like cross country deserved to be kind of talked about on, on, in the same breadth and the same scale, which of course was more of a dream than a reality, but uh, with kind of the big names and stars and statistics that should have been prevalent in other sports. Now, do I think that's absolutely going to happen? Probably not. But um, it was a driving factor in my own appreciation of the sport. And I remember uh, as I grew more invested into what cross country was, I felt like there was a, a, a large underappreciation for the sport. And one of the earliest things that I did was um, kind of put together a, an anthology of sorts um, on YouTube that recognized um, kind of major races and fast finishes and things that can still be found on online. Um, but I really wasn't writing about the sport until I decided that I really need to do, needed to assemble the information I had into some, some sort of book. And from there, I had to get my foot in the door as, as a writer uh, so that I would be recognized <laughs> in, in, the, uh, in the professional world. And so I, I used some connections uh, to talk to the editor of Track and Field News, which um, also began in the Bay Area and has been seen as kind of the Bible of the sport. And they were the first publication to put any of, of the information I had gathered into print. And uh, I had written this early article, this is I think back in 2013, um, about cross country running's legacy in the Olympic Games and how, you know, at that time it was becoming a little bit more common in the uh, conversation to hear that cross country running was trying to make a comeback into the Olympics. And I wrote kind of the, the origin of that conversation and where that, that conversation had started, which had a long legacy. Uh, cross country running, of course, was in the Olympics in the 19 teens and 20s, uh, disappeared after a, a pretty extreme running in Paris in 1924, where only 15 finishers actually crossed the finish line. Um, and we can talk more about that in a minute. Um, yeah. But the, the, the legacy of actually getting cross country back into the Olympics has a, has a more interesting history than the, the actual sport in the Olympics hmm. um, and, and is uh, almost 100 years old at this point. So there, there, there were a lot of moments as, as a writer, as a fan, as someone who was associated with the sport to look at cross country objectively and say, you know what, this is interesting to me. I need to know more about this. I need to get more involved in this. I need to do more homework on this. And from there, it just kind of took off. And now did you do your degree in history? So I was a philosophy undergrad. Okay. Um, I got my teaching credential in history and in English. So I was teaching English and history in high schools. Mm -hmm. um, I taught for about 10 years. Um, I taught abroad. I taught uh, in private and public settings. And um, I got my master's from Stanford in the liber liberal arts, which touched on a number of different topics, uh, among them uh, religion, art history, philosophy, um, linguistics, all kinds of different interesting subjects. Hmm. And uh, they demanded that there be a subject of, of notable worth to pursue for their master's thesis program, and it had to be original. And the subject of the history of cross country, which hadn't really been written about and compiled, um, was the subject that I ended up choosing. So it worked out really well in the timeline of what I was interested in. Um, but my background really developed because there, there isn't like a major of uh, you know, cross country running history, uh, to pursue. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, go ahead. No, I, I had to start from scratch. Yeah. And it's fascinating how you combined these, uh, different paths. You know, you had the hobby and you started writing and you made connections and then you put it into your work too. It, it really, you know, that shows great care and great skill to put all those things together and, ultimately have an end product and at the, presumably at the time you were teaching as well, or you were coaching as well yeah so my my days <laughs> of madness uh, were essentially writing the book in my spare time which was a, a lot of weekend hours a lot of friday nights that you know kept in instead of going out with my friends to the bars 
Um, and then over the course of the work week, I'd get up at 4.30, I'd open the doors to a local gym, and I'd work at the front desk of the gym as people came in to do their morning workouts. And I'd be writing for about two to three hours every morning before going off to teach at eight. And then after teaching, would coach for another couple hours and come back and work, work at night. And so it was a full-time job. It was really like working a second full-time job in addition to teaching and coaching. Um, but I managed it pretty, pretty nicely. I, I had the luxury of working in, in great settings with a lot of supportive um, administrators, you know, as a teacher. And like I said, I took a little bit of time off teaching at one point and dedicated about a year to the, to the research and writing element. And um, I, right. I used those connections. Yeah, it's fascinating. And one of the things before we sort of get into the content of, of you know, the actual history of cross country, um, w one of the interesting things is this sort of method that you use um, of an event spotlight and like cultural spotlights. There's lots of quotes throughout the book. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the format and, and why you chose to do it that way? Uh, you know, I think it was really out of necessity rather than preference although it worked well for what the book ultimately became. Um, as I was putting it together initially, I didn't think of it as, as kind of a cumulative anthology or a cumulative work. I was really just trying to put things in chronological order to help myself in, in <laughs> understanding exactly what the history was. And it just made sense to organize it in a format that could be seen in a kind of a global stance, a global mindset of where the sport started, how it changed and grew over time and, and the different kind of peaks and valleys that it endured. And then also to look at it as a fan of the sport in smaller chunks to kind of itemize um, particular races or particular moments that were special to the sport and deserved a little bit more attention. And I kind of created the idea of what I wanted to you know, use as the ultimate format of the book, like you said, incorporating these little um, cultural uh, standpoint, you know, chapters, we have women in running, we have um, media attire and footwear, which I think is a really nice focus. Mm -hmm. um, we have the Olympic chapter, of course, the, the kind of these, these opportunities in the book to really narrow down the focus. And then, of course, every decade has its own kind of uh, event spotlight as well. So, um, it really was just as a, as a fan of, of what I was understanding and processing in the course of my research that I decided that I wanted to find opportunities throughout the book to really narrow down the focus so that someone who picked it up could say, wow, that's really interesting and fascinating. I want to know more about that and use it as a springboard to kind of get deeper and deeper into the subject the way that I did. And so, yeah, ultimately that's where it was born. Yeah. And I found it, um, it you know, it's always a massive task when, I mean, anyone's trying to write a complete history or a global history or anything. And, and I've had, you know, a lot of historians on the show to talk about those sort of things. And each, you know, each person has to approach it in their own way. Um, one of the issues that comes along with this is when you're writing such a big history, it's hard to focus, but you seem to have uh, been able to do that well, even though it's a global sport. But one thing cross country has that say, uh, soccer doesn't have in the same way is international competition and so in it cross country is a bit individual and it's a bit of a team game maybe more so than our other team sports so can you talk a little bit of maybe about the origins of cross country and and what is this sport it's it's kind of strange isn't it Sure. Uh, the way, the best way to characterize cross country running to someone who may not be familiar with exactly what it is, um, is that under the umbrella of athletics, which includes things like marathon running and track and field, uh, cross country running was essentially born at the same time in the 19th century, um, where amateur athletes who had leisure time for the first time in history, you know, after the industrial revolution, were taking advantage of their leisure time to go outdoors and participate in group sports. Um, games like cricket, uh, rowing, uh, croquet, um, rock climbing. There are a lot of interesting examples in the 19th century, particularly of groups of gentlemen and gentlemen exclusively. It was almost like they, they barred anyone of, of a, a tradesman's background, or of course women were excluded at this point, um, from participating in these sports that were kind of like exclusive outings almost. And so it really wasn't a recognizable, um, well 
followed events the way that it is now. I mean, even in the margins of, of more popular sports. And so cross country itself was born out of imitation. Uh, Schoolboys in the early 1800s would imitate uh, fox hunts on horseback, which at that point were widely popular among the social elite. And in schools and ac you know, academic settings, they would imitate fox hunts uh, on foot because they weren't afforded the luxury of being able to do them on horseback. And so they created their own games, games like Chalk the Corner in urban settings or Hare and Hounds or um, the Paper Chase, as it was known. And they would adapt these rules where you'd have hares or foxes go out early, then you'd have the second group, the pack, following um, hare hunters or harriers as they were known. And then you'd have um, kind of the final brigade of older uh, students who would um, take the, the, uh, the lasting uh, group to come out. And they would all basically follow this either predetermined route through the woods or undetermined route through the woods. And the entire event was for the sake of the chase. It really was an untimed follow the leader exercise in the most rough and tumble way possible where you had students, you know, belly hedging, jumping over hedges, literally getting scraped up and scratched up, um, running through things like the water splash, which was a recognizable creek bed usually, where students were expected to, you know, jump in the ravine, uh, sometimes as much as waist deep. And what developed was, of course, this very out of bounds, risque, extreme viewed fun game that uh, schoolboys were regarded for in the most schoolboy way possible. But what ended up happening in England, particularly, was this development of the game into the adult gentleman ranks over the course of about a generation or two. Mm. And as these boys grew up into men and were regarded as gentlemen amateur athletes, they recounted their days as schoolboys and they brought the Hare and Hounds game into the public eye through organized events, steeplechases, um, foot grinds as they called them. And it was adapted for university uh, play. It was adapted for gentlemen amateur ranks. And you had harrier clubs who sprung up all over England and elsewhere, Scotland, Wales, Ireland, France, the United States, Canada, Australia, all about the same period through what they, you know, termed emigre, which is essentially the, the expanse of the English empire through this period. And the game really took hold because it was fun to play. <laughs> and in the, in the course of about a generation or two, like I said, the game began to simplify because it was harder and harder to maintain the originality of the task of running through the woods in a predetermined or undetermined route. And it became simpler just to time the route that, that was, you know, understood to be, you know, the courses of the age. You know, they had names and things like the tots and the long or the crick run. And these places were kind of characterized by their extremeness or their notable features, you know, jumping over, you know, the Beverly Brook or whatever it was that they called it. And each location had their own reputation. And so when they began to organize in the amateur ranks, they ultimately decided to have kind of open invitationals, which became the first open championships. And by the end of the 19th century, it was understood that every year you'd have, you know, kind of the club championship and you would bring together these groups of Harrier clubs and they'd all, you know, represent on, on their, you know, amateur standing and they'd all race the same route on the same day. And pretty soon, you know, cross country running was a common thing and it was expected that it was just part of the amateur ranks. And so that was really the origin of the sport. Yeah, and it's fascinating to hear. Um, it's similar to a lot of sport origin stories that are, you know, sort of spread out through empire and the uh, end of industrialization or the continued industrialization where, with more and more leisure time. Um, but one interesting thing about cross country is the sort of interaction it has with geography in ways that other sports um, don't necessarily do on, on, in terms of direct competition. Um, you know, certainly Canada's good at hockey. Well, they have a lot of ice and things like that. But in cross country, the geography plays a big role. It, it's absolutely stunning. And it's a part that's kind of overlooked, even in my own research, you know, the appreciation for the land and the environment in which you were able to run was really a defining factor of what made a good cross country runner early on. And England at the time was just in this, this blossoming of industrialization, like you mentioned, but it was really in a collaboration in protected parkland that enabled England to kind of maintain a hold on 
you know, the cutting edge runners and the cutting edge championship holding that made them such notorious distance runners. And Mm. they were kind of seen as the forebearers of the sport and, of course, were expected to be the best at it. When England and France first met in 1898 to run what they called the Cross de International, the very first international cross-country meeting of any worth, this is actually the forebearer of the modern international, the modern World Cross-Country Championship, they held a race in Paris, and it was such a blowout that England literally, their top runners, finished together with the same time because there was no other competition to challenge them. The French were so far back that, you know, everyone came up to see, to hope that the French would challenge them on their home course necessarily, quote-unquote. And the English were just so dominant that it was kind of laughable. It was like, well, you know, we should do this more, but you guys really ought to catch up. And of course the French did. So they made it quite a competition quickly. But in, in all respects, wherever it took hold, either in Australia or Canada or on the East Coast of the United States, in England and France and all these places, it was expected that the earliest form of the game would include a lot of trespassing and hedge jumping and fence jumping. And that in later iterations of the game, you find that as you know, urban cities developed, it, it kind of encroached on where you could run your, your cross country meets. And there were certain locations that were well known, even at the turn of the century, places in New York like Morris Park, which there's a neighborhood that's Morris Park these days, but of course there's not kind of the, the, um, the horse race uh, environment in, in surrounding countryside that includes well for cross country running. But out of necessity, you, you, you find other locations today that kind of are van, vanguards of the sport. And, um, and what's interesting is that, you know, over time these places change, but they're all fairly recognizable still as places of, you know, environment that are notoriously uh, common, well-known for the various characteristics. Yeah, it's very interesting. And then um, some of these great challengers uh, that start to challenge England do come from uh, different environments, but environments that would be good for for challenging running conditions. And there's, you know, there are some pretty funny fo- photos of, of Pavo Nermi jumping over walls and in what looks like Olympic events. Um, so cross country becomes an Olympic event and, and Finland a uh, emerges as well. Um, can you talk a little bit about cross country making it to the Olympics and, and what its role, what its spot was? Because, you know, we have the marathon as sort of this um, seminal event in the Olympics. What was cross country's place in these early games? Absolutely. So what's interesting about cross country running and the Olympics is that the Olympic movement and cross country were basically born and popularized at the same time. So they came up in the timeline of athletics as kind of cousins and and uh, the early influencers of the Olympic movement were very familiar with cross country running. And there's all these ties that today are completely forgotten because cross country hasn't been in the Olympics since the 1920s and is, is now kind of interpreted as this winter sport. Does it have a place in the winter Olympics where when it came up in the 1920s and the 19 teens and was introduced a little bit before then uh, by the British, it was, taken without hesitation as a summer Olympic sport. So it's interesting that cross country, you know, was on the same calendar system, the same kind of a, a seen as the finale almost of the, uh, the Olympic athletic movement, which is to say they ran track races and then the marathon. And of course, cross country was the final kind of athletic event on the calendar. So mm-hmm. what ended up happening was the British introduced the sport because at the time the international was essentially just the British Commonwealth countries and France. And so they introduced it as just another opportunity to, to exercise their British dominance in the athletic events. But what ended up happening was because the Olympic movement was open to so many other European countries, the Swedes and the Finns quickly took hold and took notice and trained hard for it and dominated the, the cross country events to the extent that you have Pablo Nermi, of course, in 1924, jumping over the rock wall and finishing well ahead of the field. And he sits there on the infield and they say, Pablo, well, you know, how did you win so quickly? And he says, well, everyone else trained for me. Of course, the truth was that they ran the cross country event three times. It was interrupted with the first world war, but at the final running of this event, they held it in the hottest summer day in Parisian Olympic history. It was like 98 degrees or something ridiculous. And they ran it, of course, in the weeds and the brush surrounding the Olympic Stadium. And it really wasn't a predetermined cross-country course as much as it was the out of bounds of every other athletic event. It was like around the tennis courts and stuff like that. And they ran it in the, in the Parisian 
Olympic uh, neighborhood, which of course had a factory that was continuously spewing toxic waste into the atmosphere. And all these athletes, if you look at the early footage, got completely dehydrated and disoriented. And even when they're entering back into the stadium to finish the race, you have athletes that are running into the walls, running into each other, staggering, fainting, crawling across the finish line. And uh, what ended up happening was the British, I think, finished fifth or something very unremarkable and, and unexpected, only 15 total finishers. And of course, uh, Finland wins, Sweden second, and the United States is third. And it was kind of a turning point in the international gambit of the sport, because to that point, like I said, the international was largely just British and French teams dominating alternatively. And Sweden and Finland weren't even invited. And the United States, of course, had their own traditions, but weren't invited to the international either. And so it was kind of a remarkable finale to the sport across country in the Olympics, because it was unfortunately taken out due to this one extreme event, and they were seeing, saying things like, oh, this is, this is terrible on, on the body, and, and of, of, you know, we, we don't want to advertise that we're harming our athletes, putting them, subjecting them to such extreme conditions. But in the annuals of cross-country running, this is just it's a wonderful moment because it was the final time and it was the most extreme time that cross-country was in the Olympics. And what's funny now is when you hear it, uh, you know, nearly 100 years later, uh, you just think, man, that would make some really good TV right now. And, oh, and, and you know, the Olympics are kind of struggling along. Like, it just sounds, how compelling is that? Well, the modern Olympic movement, and I'm sure that we'll, you know, maybe want to revisit this subject in a little bit. Um, but the modern Olympic movement is really hungry for a younger audience, and they're really looking for more extreme variations of, of games and sports to include in the Olympic offering because they want a younger audience to be excited about the Olympics. And for the Paris 2024 movement, what they're trying to do is incorporate things like breakdancing and skateboarding and surfing and all these really interesting alternative sports. Um, and cross country is up there in the mentions and has an opportunity to return, which is very exciting. Yeah, it certainly is interesting. And what's interesting is about those in, you know, we shouldn't dwell too much on the president, but um, the, the it's a lot of individual sports that are being introduced to kind of capture the mind. But the cool thing about cross country is it still has a sort of team aspect. Um, maybe you can share a little bit about how cross country's sort of rise in the United States or, or as a team sport. Sure, absolutely. So, so how does the, the sport of cross country develop such a team affiliation out of this kind of hodgepodge of, of <clears throat> imitating fox hunting, right? Yeah. Well, as they organized through the 19th century, these harrier clubs needed to determine a way to score the race, um, right? As, as they determined routes and, and measured courses, uh, how do you know that you've won, aside from the very first finisher of, of the event? Well, they started counting the finishers for team places fairly early in the determination of these open steeplechases and cross-country matches. And what essentially was born was that um, in the professional ranks, quote-unquote, uh, you know, uh, adult ranks, you would have about six finishers per team uh, counted, the first six finishers for each side. And like golf, their places were added up and the lowest score was the winner, right? So if you have the first six finishers, you add up one, two, three, four, five, and six together. And of course, that's 21 points, and that would be the lowest that you could possibly score for your, um, for your sport, right? And so uh, in the course of, of trying to change the sport as it, was, as it was adapted in the university ranks, you had five finishers as seen as the top five to score, and in, 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 in the amateur uh, junior ranks, it was the top four. Now, in some variations, because of the kind of the placing system, what they found was that if you finished early, you know, with a number of good athletes, well, you could finish pretty far back with your final one or two and still win the meet. And so they adapted mm -hmm. some of these rules to see if they could measure it with the lowest time aggregate versus the lowest place aggregate. And it just was really hard to keep track of in the early days of cross country. So they, they, they shied away from doing that. And the question that I was asked often by coaches today is like, well, where did we get the scoring system from? And it really developed out of England. It started with this kind of different uh, jurisdiction of the rank between adults and juniors and, and collegiate athletes. And in the United States, of course, when it was adapted in universities and, and in preparatory schools, it was really appealing to see kind of team rivalries grow up with the sport. 
And at the time, the Ivy Leagues were really the, 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 the foundation of, of amateur sport in America. And uh, schools like Harvard and Cornell and Yale and Princeton all fielded cross-country teams, and the Ivy League rivalry was really blossoming with cross-country at the same time. Now, was back then, was it the same way as sort of you started your story? Because you said, you know, I just didn't grow up <laughs> as tall as the other people. Um, and Ivy League had football, too. So, so was it athletes who weren't playing football who were running cross-country? Or was it something that athletes did everything? That's a wonderful question. And there's a great degree of overlap between our modern understanding of excelling in different sports and kind of this previous amateur gentleman notion that we see at the turn of the century. Uh, as sports historians might have shared in other games, you know, of, of the same kind, athletes who were really good at football were also really good at other sports at the same time, right? Uh, American baseball and American rules football developed kind of simultaneously around the turn of the century. And it was really at this moment that we see schools and universities particularly trying to manage and organize these sports for the first time. Well, runners at that point, really, they still weren't as popular as a football team or a baseball team, even back then. But you would have these athletes that were just studs, and they would come out and they would play football, they would run track, they would play baseball, and they would do it all in the same weekend. And the overlap for this, for this, uh, this opportunity is striking, and, and there's a really particularly great story that includes this, this, this athlete named Robert Bacon, who ran for Harvard prior to the 20th century, prior to 1900. And he was just, he was the model Adonis. He played football, he played baseball, he was like, you know, general athlete of the year in Harvard. And his good friend was a guy that we will know in history as Teddy Roosevelt, <laughs> uh, president of the United States. And the two of them grew up together and went to Harvard together, and they attended the school at the same time. And Robert Bacon, of course, shows up in cross-country running history as one of the first to organize and participate in Harvard's Hare and Hound Club, which uh, organized roughly in the 1870s. So we're talking about a generation before the turn of the century. But, of course, he appears, and there's a lot of questioning as to whether Teddy Roosevelt, prior to becoming president of the United States, was really the first well-known president to participate in cross-country running. <laughs> and uh, there's a lot of interest in history there. His sons, he wrote to his sons letters about cross-country running and things like that. So we know that he knew about the sport. And, of course, he was known for going on these hiking jaunts and jogs through the uh, surrounding uh, White House exterior and, and, you know, taking, visiting foreign diplomats on wild excursions. And so I have a hunch that he probably participated when he was at Harvard in a few cross-country chases of his own. Now, to answer your question more generally, um, rowing clubs were really the first groups to allow their athletes to train in cross country in the off season. And in the early Ivy league annuals, you'll find that some teams were really good at cross country and certain teams were not the teams that were not disbarred their track athletes from participating in any sort of cross country event because it was seen as making them slow for the track. If you can believe that. Mm. So, you know, the early track athletes, you know, in some schools were shunned from running cross country, but others embraced it and really flourished as kind of the first dual sport athletics achievers. So that was pretty interesting. Yeah, it is fascinating. And, and Theodore Roosevelt is still out here in Washington running around the baseball stadium as a mascot, unfortunately, now. Um, <laughs> yeah, but uh, so we have this like high class, you know, bougie athletics in the 19th um, century and then the turn of the century and the development of the collegiate program in the United States at the Ivy Leagues. These are a certain class of people. Um, and that changes over time. And one of the, you know, most famous sort of working class runners that we get is Steve Prefontaine. Um, is, is there, is Prefontaine is sort of element uh, or emblematic of a shift between classes or does it happen sooner or later than that? You know, that's a wonderful question. And it really, in the course of the 20th century, we see the acceptance of the sport for the exact same reasons why it's popular today. I mean, if you were to travel back a hundred years, you would find all the cross country runners were exactly the same as they are today, right? It's a sport that's relatively even in gender representation. Um, we see early in the 1930s and 40s, the very first time that, that female participation in cross country grows um, at, at a prolific rate. 
Um, and so if you go back about 100 years, maybe about 75 years or so, you'd find that most of the cross-country teams are representative of the same uh, class, social, and, and um, racial representation as you see in, in today's climate. But if you go back into the sport about 200 years ago, it's, it's almost distinctly male. It's almost distinctly privileged white upper class male. And it, it, of course, you had to have access to the countryside and time to enjoy the countryside in order to participate. What changes is, of course, the First and Second World Wars, which open up not only an opportunity for more working class individuals to gain acceptance and access to what was previously seen as elite privileged opportunities in the countryside, but also a more international opportunity to share, you know, access points and international points to, of travel to, to, to really expand the horizon of the sport. And so, of course, it grows nationally in the United States as different cities and, 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 and metropolitan areas grow, but it also grows internationally. And you see kind of a, a, an inclusion of places like Switzerland and Belgium and uh, Liechtenstein and, of course, the, uh, the introduction of the sport into Kenya and Ethiopia and East Africa. And so what happens by the time we get to the 1950s, 60s, and 70s is not only has the baby boom um, increased kind of the, the quantity of good athletes that are available to run, uh, it, it increases the opportunity of, of different classes to mingle and to travel and to compete against each other. And so by the time that we get Steve Prefontaine in the late 1960s and early 1970s, the identity of the typical cross-country runner really hasn't changed that much in a generation or two but the wealth of opportunity available to cross-country runners has certainly changed. And so Steve, you know, pre is just, he is iconic for all the reasons why every runner gets up in the morning and heads out the door, which is to say he was a working man from Coos Bay, Oregon, who just worked harder than anyone else at what he loved to do. And he was certainly flashy and had a, an attitude of his own and a personality of his own that was emblematic of, of so many, you know, kind of iconic, cool, uh, trendy, cutting edge, uh, uh, you know, media personalities at the time. I mean, this is the rise of rock and roll. You've got the rise of, of kind of alternative behaviors and, and American counterculture and things like that. And running was certainly influenced by that. And of course, the, the rise of uh, blue ribbon sports, which eventually became Nike, uh, was influenced by that. So, so there's a lot of things happening that was propelling uh, athletes like Steve Prefontaine into the limelight for the first time. And one of the cultural, uh, not cultural spotlights, but event spotlights in the book is the 1969 uh, race between Jerry Lindgren and Steve Prefontaine. Uh, Steve was a um, freshman at the University of Oregon and, Steve, and um, Jerry Lindgren, of course, was a senior at Washington State. And they raced in the very first Pacific 8 cross-country uh, conference championship, which was held in Stanford's. Uh, golf course. And it was really the final time that you see, you know, Lindgren as, uh, you know, maybe a more humbled version of himself. Uh, he was coming back from injury against a very fresh and raw Steve Prefontaine who was seeking to prove himself. But it was this kind of um, very iconic opportunity to see the kind of the, the lanky and nerdy looking Lindgren against this rock star stud, Steve Prefontaine, who's walking around with his chest out in the era. And so, you know, running really changed with his arrival, but it had been changing a little bit for, you know, previous generations to that point. Yeah. And it is kind of interesting though. So Prefontaine does put that, that sort of like, you know, I'm just going to go out there and I'm going to run as hard as I can and, and win my race kind of attitude. But uh, it's, he's enormously talented as well. Um, can you talk a little bit about sort of how that has shifted in running? So if for a long time, it's dominated by these European nations and then after the 70s, basically, when the African nations start running, cross-country is just totally dominated by East African nationals. Um, how does that happen? Well, it's, it's, it's almost like cross-country was a victim of its own success. And it's easy to see it objectively, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to write it in the book as kind of a global history. Because people are always asking this question, even today, even in the mm -hmm. highest ranks of the organizational bodies. They look at the, the sport and they say, how did the Africans become so dominant? It actually has made, in some cases, uh, European nations say, we don't even want to participate. We don't even want to try against Ugandans or Kenyans or Ethiopians because we can't, we can't compete. How did that happen? Well, 
it, it happened because cross country is such an egalitarian and accessible sport that you see the rise and fall of different pockets of talent because it's so accessible. You don't need any sort of formal training or formal access to equipment in order to flourish at the sport. And really what makes it memorable is that if you put enough effort into kind of building the climate of a good community that supports cross country running, that you can flourish and maintain the dominance for generations, right? And so what you see early in the 20th century is that England and France who have believed in the sport and fostered, cultured the sport are dominating the sport. And after the Second World War, the uh, IAAF enters the scene. They, they uh, invite other nations, European nations, into the fore. Belgium becomes a powerhouse in the 1960s. They treat the sport really seriously and other European powers too. And so by the 1960s and 70s, Europe really felt like, well, we are the ones that are treating the sport seriously. We will forever be dominant in the sport. Well, a curious thing happens in the 1960s and 70s. The first is that uh, the first East Africans are really dominant on the track and they get, you know, the best of the best out there. We get uh, characters like Mamo Wold and uh, um, Kip Kaino of, of Kenya who, who competes in the Olympic Games in 1968. But another thing that happens is that you have a lot of East Africans that enter the American university system and places that recruit heavily with East Africans, uh, Washington State, um, and uh, of all places, uh, University of Texas, El Paso, and um, a few other universities that are kind of notable for recruiting East Africans into their track and field and cross country teams, um, help bring exposure to the sport and kind of the final tipping point is that in the late 1970s, the IAAF ends up subsidizing access to not third world countries necessarily, but developing athletics programs and subsidizing the cost to participate. And so now uh, countries like Kenya and, and Ethiopia have access to uh, international meets and they can travel internationally and compete against the Europeans on a regular basis. And of course that opens the floodgates for, for treating the sport seriously in East Africa. And what they do, because they essentially have had a cross-country background for hundreds and hundreds of years, is they, they simply tweak what they've already known to be working, and that is association and serious training. Um, training up to three times a day in the Kenyan Highlands and the Rift Valley will make anyone a strong runner. <laughs> and uh, certainly subsidized access to international travel and competition make, you know, competitors stronger at what they do. And it wasn't long before, you know, in the mid 1980s, you have Kenya and Ethiopia winning cross country races at the world championships at international meetings on a quite regular basis to the point where it just became a uniform expectation that Kenya and Ethiopia and, and to a lesser extent, Morocco and Uganda uh, would continuously dominate and, 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 and show up to these events and expect to win. Yeah, and it is kind of extraordinary. Like you see breaking two and like when they're trying to tweak Elliot Kipchoge into a, you know, break two hour marathon, um, the scientists are just kind of like marveling. Like uh, he was doing everything right before we even got here. Like we can't coach this, you know, because a lot of the stuff was in play. Plus, you add into it coaching, and it's just an extraordinary comp combination. I also think it's interesting how you mentioned kind of the travel, and um, it seems like uh, cross country is certainly a really global sport, and the jet age helps that. One thing that didn't doesn't really help it is how difficult it is to make uh, racing spectator friendly, or at least it was like in the TV sort of stages? I mean, how do you film a group of a lot of different people going through the woods? Uh, right. Yeah. You know, the, the counterpoint to what cross country is as a sport is that it's necessarily unspectator friendly, right? The idea is you send the, these athletes into the woods and you're not expected to see them again until after at least five miles have been covered. And so it doesn't make coverage of the sport easy. And it, of all the ways that cross country has excelled, uh, media coverage is certainly not one of them. And they had an opportunity early in, in history to really make a point of advertising, you know, how unique it was to participate in cross country runs, which of course uh, are, are necessarily uh, uphill, in the mud, in the muck, in the woods, jumping over logs, jumping over hurdles, under barriers and, and quite, you know, exciting to see 
but of course, inaccessible to the to most common observers. So how do you reconcile that? Well, in the 1970s and 80s, they really did a good job of popularizing it in Europe, but in the United States, they didn't do much to cover the sport. And even in the 1970s, you'll find, uh, you know, archival footage of cross country running, but really it's just the beginning, it's the end, and maybe a few highlights in between. In Europe, they really dedicated themselves to the craft of following the athletes as they, you know, went around the course, which was the nature of the game. But it also developed in Europe into a fashion of running around measure two kilometer, three kilometer loops. And that was a much more, you know, navigatable uh, opportunity than it was in the United States where you have athletes running around places like Van Cortland Park, you know, mm-hmm. deep into the New York uh, wilderness, up hills, you know, up Cemetery Hill. It's hard to film that regularly. So it, it really wasn't out of any sort of intent. Uh, it really was just born out of necessity, this idea that, well, we can't really cover the sport to advertise it well, so we won't even try to kind of, you know, work on that aspect of it. Uh, whereas on the track and in other sporting events, uh, media really developed well. I mean, if you think about tennis or hockey or track and field, um, timing systems and camera systems, everything was developed alongside the growing um, opportunities for athletes to perform. And especially now, we see sport and sport following is shifting for, uh, well, I'll, I, it looks like two reasons, but the, but I'm sure you have more. Um, one thing that I've noticed in hockey is now that we have HD and like really good quality pictures all over, people can follow the puck a little easier. So the more people are watching hockey and, and I think in cross country, you know, with technology like drones and things like that, really tiny cameras, you know, we have the potential now to track runners through really exciting parts of the race that you haven't seen before. And then the second uh, sort of thing is the access you have to the events. Um, And because there's a lot of youth playing these sports. So like youth soccer has created a enormous fan base years down the road and cross country, a lot of people compete in junior levels and then it just kind of fades away. So it seems like the, the tools are there. Absolutely, and if cross country has done anything right, it's that it's cultured the game continuously through the amateur youth ranks. And in this very age of you know smart televisions and, and media devices to distract students, we're seeing still um, steady growth in the high school and collegiate ranks in the United States. And every year it grows a little bit more. It's not growing exceptionally fast, but um, still a top 10 participation sport in the U.S. And you have about half a million students who run. And one thing that's interesting today is in the last 10 years, the explosion of obstacle course races and mud runs and tough mudders (laughs) races has proven that there is an, an audience that will sit down and watch these events on television and that they can be covered well. And it's to cross country's demise, the fact that it wasn't developed sooner, this appreciation for kind of the media savvy, edgy angle of, of marketing the sport for what it really is, which is the original mud run. And, and you know, the, the original um, opportunity for athletes to compete and, and really perform at a high level. Now, do you think uh, cross country is, I mean, it's pretty clear from your language that you sound pretty optimistic about it. But for me, you know, one of the things we were talking about is accessibility. For me, it's just easier to lace up a pair of shoes and then go run. I live in the city, so, you know, I can get some nice trails in but very defined trails (laughs) for a very limited time. and it seems like uh, there's a trend of urbanization. It, that's, it, that would be a hard thing for cross country to sort of counter, don't you think? Well, yes and no, right? We live in an age now where more people live in the city than ever before. And certainly in urban centers around the world, we're seeing um, you know, the best athletes because that's where the populations are born out of city and urban environments. Mm-hmm. But athletes the countryside, uh, the world over, has never been greater, meaning that the accessibility of the countryside has never been greater. Um, For most Americans and most Westerners, I guess you could say, um, leaving your doorstep and running in an urban environment is essentially what we know now is kind of take for granted, par for the course. But I mean, we would all be challenged to think of a park or a trail that wasn't close enough 
and we could at least access it, right? Uh, very few people would be able to answer and say, you know what, I've never been to the countryside. I've never seen a trail or, or a state park. And until that's the case, then I would really be worried about it. Um, the best cross country teams in the Bay Area uh, in high schools and colleges are the ones that are landlocked in urban, in urban settings that are far from the nearest park or con uh, countryside. Um, and yet they take buses on a daily or weekly basis to get to those places and train and they're stronger than ever. So I believe in the opportunity of, of racing cross country, but I agree that urbanization is, is making a small dent into the opportunities. And so the, the I'm kind of interested in these teams that are bussing out to go train. Um, is it like you find a course and keep training uh, uh, on the same area or do you just go out of the urban area and train? Well, you know, the top level cross country teams do have places that they regularly measure. Right. And so when you coach cross country athletes, you have to have barometers of success in it. And that requires you to go back to, to places that you know you can trust in terms of um, measuring fitness of your athletes. Um, and so, you know, for example, I was, I was coaching at a high school that essentially worked on two or three trails fairly regularly, which meant that we didn't bus out very long or very often to, to new environments just to go running. Uh, we went to pretty regular sites, uh, most of them off the pavement, um, but ones that we could measure in, in time and train our athletes and see our athletes regularly to, to make sure that they were getting in the proper amount of work. But variation is key in cross country because the courses themselves change so regularly. And so um, when I was just starting out as a coach and I was in charge of my own team, uh, I would you know, schedule our buses to happen on staff development days. And so you know, in most school systems now, students have an opportunity to get off campus early at least once a day of the week or every other week or something to that effect. And I would make sure that we got, you know, deep into the forest or take them to the beach and run on the sand or in the sand dunes and do regular appointments in places that they normally wouldn't be able to get access to just so that we could, you know, really have fun and test ourselves in an environment that wasn't necessarily um, what you would see every day. Yeah, that is very cool. Um, and now we, and it's awesome too to be in the Bay Area where you have access to different environments like forest and beach, all pretty close. Um, we've seen the geographic shifts both uh, continentally and internationally. So like in the US, you know, kind of starting with the Ivy Leagues and, but you said, and you point out in your book, we didn't talk about it too much, but the Midwest has a great tradition of running and, you know, it's certainly still going strong on the East Coast, but there is this sort of renaissance that happens in the West Coast. And it seems like a lot of young talent is coming out of Arizona and the American Southwest now as well. Um, and then internationally, we could talk about it as well with Africa. We've talked about it a little bit. Um, what geographic trend do you see happening? Where are the places to be now if you're a cross-country runner? Well, th that's a wonderful question because cross-country, like I said, has the greatest of accessibility. You don't need anything special to be a cross-country runner. And any environment that you consider to be local to your home is really the, the grassroots starting place for almost every great distance runner today. You look at Shalane Flanagan, you look at Galen Rupp, you look at uh, Leo Manzano, you look at um, all of these athletes that you can kind of recognize uh, as, as figureheads in the sport, and each of them grew up in a different environment and still participated in cross country at a high level. Um, even in, in Africa, you know, with the most recent world championships being in Denmark, uh, you had European finishers from the Nordic nations, from Spain and Portugal, the Mediterranean uh, regions, uh, England did very well, Canada did very well. And that's what makes cross country running so wonderful is that it's an egalitarian process and that really there is no definitive right answer. Um, in my research, <laughs> there was a, an article in the, maybe in the 1980s at some stage where there was kind of an exodus away from Oregon and Washington, which had in the 1970s really boomed with the running boom of the 1970s. And writers, sports writers were saying, you know, where's the hot destination to be now? And of course, everyone said, well, Boulder, Colorado, that's where everyone needs to go to train. And of course, Colorado became a really strong um, university, you know, distance program under Mark Wetmore. Uh, but it, it wasn't always that way. And, and, and you hear quotes like, uh, Wetmore, who says, you know, we've won championships in the mud and in adverse conditions, but Colorado is really dry and dusty most of the cross-country season. So it's not really explainable how certain uh, 
environments are more conductive to, to good cross-country programs than others. And, and like I said before, it really speaks to the places that treat it seriously, who fostered community aspects that go beyond just running miles. And, you know, Kenyans have won world championships in Europe in the mud and in Boston in the snow and in <laughs> you know, desert environments, uh, among others. And so there really is no de definitive answer to say, where do you train now? Where do you go to, to get the best environment? Although it's easy to see that, you know, countries like Ethiopia and Kenya and Uganda are really treating their program seriously and have um, a surplus of, of really uh, serious training athletes who consider distance running to be kind of their opportunity for um, social improvement. That's great. Yeah. And I like that focus on the community. Um, before we get to the, the final segment, the suggestions are, is there any project that you're working on in the future? What's next? What do you do after you've written the total history? <laughs> well, the most recent uh, achievement of the sport, which really puts a statement on where the sport is going in the future, is to say that a lot of the recent news surrounding cross-country running was really um, dismal. It was in despair. There was a lot of negativity surrounding the sport because it just wasn't popular as it should have been. And it really was a youth-driven sport, but in the last 20 years or so has been kind of forgotten in the professional ranks because of the dominance of certain countries and kind of the aspect of the sport that it's hard to uh, watch, it's hard to market it popularly. And my belief, optimistic, you know, if you want to call it that, is just to, to note that realistically, if it's in a, a bottom position, is just primed for a strong comeback. And we saw that recently uh, in the last week or so with the World Championship held in Aarhus in Denmark. Um, the organizers there put an emphasis not only of the experience of running a really tough and spectator friendly cross country course that had elements of the water splash and mud and sand in a hill that was 10% grade on the top of a biking museum. I kid you not. Um, they really put this as well on the history of the sport and included past champions and exhibits and uh, announcers from Shrewsbury School, the, the, the gen genesis of the sport included in this culmination of 200 years of history that was, you know, capitalized on with this amazing course and venue that they put together. So it was really the perfect storm of all these elements coming together at the same time. But it, it proved, it, it, it was really a statement that cross country could be popular and could be magnificent and could be glorious. And the proof for me was going into work on a Monday morning and hearing my boss, who has no athletic bone in his body, I guarantee you, uh, comment to me that he was watching it on NBC Sports the night before. <laughs> he was making small talk with me about cross country running in the office. And so, you know, I knew at that moment that all the hard work that was put into putting together that, that, that event for the sport was really, you know, proof of the momentum that cross country has now, which is to say, if you want to make it popular, you have every opportunity to. So where is the sport going in the next five to 10 years? Really, that's left to be determined, but there are so many good opportunities uh, for the sport. And of course, the return of cross country into the Olympics is something that I am extremely passionate about and devoting a lot of my current resources to. So conversations on that front are ongoing. Uh, there's still a lot of work to be done and a lot remains to be seen as to whether cross country will make a return to the Olympic Games. Very cool. So unfortunately, we're uh, towards the end of our hour, the, but fortunately, we're at the moment where we get to make our suggestions. So uh, do you want to go first, Andrew? What would you like to suggest to the listeners of the Hour of History podcast? I want to suggest to listeners uh, near and far that if you've never run cross country in your life and you have listened to this podcast and you said to yourself, that sounds interesting, find out more about the sport, get involved in your local community, go for a trail run, and at the very least, lace up your sneakers and just go for a run. Time yourself for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and go out, out the door. And if you're experienced and you know about the sport and you're, you're passionate about the sport, get involved, you know, find out more, comment on message boards, comment on social, social media, find us, we're out there, passionate, you know, amateur leaders that are you know, developing great ideas and collaborating on the future of the sport. It's actively taking place and you don't need a degree in order to participate. That is a fantastic suggestion. And 
I mean, we're really living in the moment where, you know, you can talk to people who are doing it, you know, you can follow the stars on Twitter. Um, in fact, I'll do with that kind of suggestion. I had a couple, but I'm going to opt with this one because it, it plays with yours. Um, I've been listening to uh, Stephen Scullion's podcast. He's a marathon runner who's trying to qualify for the 2020 Olympics, and he's really making himself accessible on Twitter and through podcasts. And it just goes to show you, you know, not only can you just lace up your shoes and go outside and run, but you can connect with the world's best athletes and, and like Andrew historians and talk to them about the sport. So the opportunities are out there. Just find what you like and, and network. So. Absolutely. Yeah. So thank you so much, Andrew, for uh, sitting down and chatting with me. The time flew by. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to say? No, I really appreciate it, Stephen. Uh, you run a good show and this has been a pleasure. Great. Thank you so much. On Hour of History, it's our world anytime, any place. So long. Thanks again for listening. Make sure to check out ourofhistory.com forward slash Rex for all the recommendations mentioned during the show. That's ourofhistory.com forward slash R-E-C-S. And if you still haven't gotten your fill of the Hour of History, be sure to head over to our blog at ourofhistory.com forward slash blog, where you'll find topics that were covered in the podcast as well as others. And that concludes this week's episode. We thank you again for listening, and we hope to have you back here next week at the Hour of History podcast.